Food prices in the U.S. soared to record heights in February 2022. Global food prices also followed suit, posting a 20.7% increase compared to last year. Highest prices we've seen since probably for the last 10 years. Stock levels, lowest levels since, in some cases, 2007-8. Um, it's particularly severe because we are just coming out of a recovery from a two-year, two-and-a-half-year pandemic that had severe implications on the price of uh, goods and services as well as the price of commodities. Coming right out of that kind of historic disturbance of the world, boom, we're hit with uh, a really huge geopolitical event. The war in Ukraine is putting a massive strain on the global food supply. The chief of UN World Food Program warned that a potential global food crisis might be on the horizon on a scale not seen since World War II. Some estimates place the total caloric value of the food exports from the Ukraine and Russia at around 12% of the globe's total calories. If the Ukrainians can't plant right now and can't get their wheat in the ground, it does mean that the 2022 planting season will not yield much if they get some in or the size harvest that the world is anticipating. This is going to be another major test to the food supply system. And we will have to watch very carefully what's happening in, in other parts of the world and um, consider ways to reduce um, risks of food shortages and, and conflict. This is going to be very challenging. So how exactly does the conflict in Ukraine pose a threat to the global food supply? And can anything be done to stop it? Russia and Ukraine are agricultural giants that provide a pivotal role in the global food supply. In 2021, Russia exported $37.3 billion worth of agricultural products to the rest of the world, while Ukraine exported more than $27 billion. They've regained their role as one of the primary breadbaskets of the world. They're not only large in wheat, but also in things like corn, uh, where they account for some 20, 25% of corn exported in the world, sunflower oil, where the two countries account for almost 75%. So a lot of nations depend on exports from those two countries. But the Russian invasion has had a drastic impact on Ukraine's agricultural exports. The country banned exports of several grains, sugar, salt, and meat in early March. The blockade of the country's port has also halted the shipment of existing grains. As a result, Ukrainian grain exports in March were four times less compared to the levels in February. To ship 9% of the world's grains when you don't have a seaport is quite difficult. Now, there's some talk about shipping on trains or on land, but it's not a substitute for the massive kinds of shipping that was existing before. There's also the question of whether Ukraine could maintain its agricultural productivity, given its current predicament. It's a really topsy-turvy, uncertain situation. You know, maybe in the far western part of Ukraine, the security system's pretty good, but are they gonna have the availability of diesel fuel to get the tillage and the planting done? Uh, and we also know a lot of farmers have probably joined the Ukrainian military, so there could be labor shortages. While Russia has yet to impose a wide export ban on agricultural goods, its involvement in Ukraine has put a massive strain on the cost of fertilizers. Prices for raw materials like ammonia, nitrogen, nitrate, phosphate, potash, and sulfate saw a 30% increase compared to the start of 2022. Russia and Belarus uh, are, are big exporters of uh, fertilizers uh, in the world and fertilizer prices have been very high natural gas prices have been very high and natural gas is a feedstock for um, nitrogen based fertilizers in early march the russian ministry recommended the country's fertilizer producers temporarily halt any exports if the price of fertilizer goes up you know that might be a relatively small price in terms of input costs that might get transferred to, to consumers. But if less fertilizer is produced and less fertilizer is applied to crops, we might have lower yields. And so that could affect total global supply of important food commodities. The global food supply was already in a fragile state before the crisis in Ukraine due to global warming, as well as supply chain disruptions caused by the pandemic. you got to realize that even prior to the invasion, global food stocks were tight. That is, uh, we've run down levels over the last couple of years. Part of that due to the pandemic, but some of it due to the fact that we had weather issues. 
We had a drought in the North, North America that affected the wheat crop last year in Canada and parts of the U.S. We're just coming out of a drought in, in South America, which has adversely affected the Brazil soybean crop. And Brazil's, you know, the largest soybean uh, exporter in the world. Coming right out of that kind of historic disturbance of the world, boom, we're hit with a really huge geopolitical event. In response, food costs have climbed to its highest level in nearly two years, while prices for commodities like wheat and corn have reached the highest it's been in a decade. The U.S. Department of Agriculture predicts that food at home prices will see an increase of up to 4% by the end of 2022. The United States is already experiencing very high inflation on food and energy prices. There is no question that the war in Ukraine will accelerate the increase in prices in both commodities, that is food, the bread you buy in your grocery store, the gasoline that you have to put in your car or truck. The United States is a net exporter of a lot of the grains that we're talking about. Um, those exports are still are affected by world prices. So we're still gonna see increased prices. And again, energy prices are world prices as well. And those are going up. As consumers, when there's a really large increase in energy prices, the consumers are going to definitely see that uh, in their prices because that affects every stage of the supply chain. While prices might rise, experts reassure that a food shortage is unlikely to occur in the United States. The U.S. doesn't import very much from, from Ukraine. A, a little bit of sunflower oil, but we grow a lot of soybeans and other so-called oil seeds that we're able to get vegetable oil. So the lack of vegetable oil from Ukraine itself is a, doesn't have much impact on, on U.S. consumers. I can say with some real confidence that in the United States, the average consumer is not going to see a shortage of bread. We may see some shelves that are empty uh, for various kinds of food products like we have as we recover from the pandemic. While richer countries have the resources to offset the shortage caused by the crisis in Ukraine, a strain on the global food supply could still hurt marginalized populations, as well as developing countries that are forced to rely heavily on imported food. I do have concerns moving forward of what will happen to households that are particularly vulnerable and particularly impacted by inflation. And I am concerned about countries that may additionally have certain frictions to global trade. There are certain countries that may be traded with Russia and Ukraine and don't have trade relations with other parts of the world where they might get these products, um, we could really see a lot of people suffering here in the near future. A global food crisis could also potentially lead to more conflicts around the world. For instance, the Arab Spring is thought to be fueled by anger surrounding the rise in food prices. Egypt, Yemen, Indonesia, Bangladesh, Ethiopia, and Lebanon, Libya, Pakistan, and Iraq. So those are the main importers of wheat. Of course, there are then others that get some from Russia and some from Ukraine. But just think about the size of these countries. And many of these places, Yemen is in an ongoing conflict. Bangladesh is on the edge because of all of the refugees coming in from Myanmar. Ethiopia is in a war with its province, Tigray. Lebanon is in an extreme state because of the crisis that it had over a year ago. Just think about all these places around the world that could blow up. There are several ways to mitigate a potential fallout. Shortly after the invasion, countries like Hungary, Serbia banned exports of certain agricultural products to protect their food supply. Experts say such protectionist measures will only have negative consequences. It might be a good short-term solution for that country in the sense that it keeps wheat prices lower uh, um, in the country, but it by not exporting, that means prices in the rest of the world are going to be even higher. And unfortunately, with ex things like export restrictions, they tend to be very contagious. We economists call this is a, a beggar thy neighbor type of contagion. So if, if one country does that, then the next country will get scared. They'll do it. And all of a sudden, you've made a very difficult situation even more difficult. The best advice is do no harm. That is, don't create additional restrictions. Don't put on export uh, restrictions and other things that can further hamper supplies to the market.
It's also important for other major producers to grow and export more food to help fill the gap left by Ukraine and Russia. There are some things that markets do very well, and part of that is increasing those incentives for farmers and producers to produce uh, goods that um, maybe there's some shock to supply in another part of the world. The European Union has already announced that they're going to take, try to take some measures to release what they call some of their set-aside acres, make it eligible for production this summer. Uh, there's been a big controversy about doing something similar here in the United States with what's called Conservation Reserve Program acres. I don't think there's probably much we can do given the late date relative to planting here for spring planted crops, but there's a possibility of maybe making some of those acres available for winter wheat production next fall. Some policies might also need a reassessment given the current situation. I think it's time to really give a hard look at things like biofuel policies. Uh, in the U.S., some 42 percent of our soybean oil goes to biodiesel production. You know, this is a time when, when vegetable oil prices of which soybean oil is one are hitting high, uh, record high levels. So I think uh, an argument to be said, why should we be putting 40% of our soybean oil into, into uh, a biodiesel. But as always, the most effective solution might be in prevention. Do as much as we can to encourage the development of agriculture within these poor consuming countries. That's probably long-term the most important thing that we can do. What I worry about every day is that this common knowledge that, oh, we will not suffer because the world has enough food is maybe coming under question if this war goes on for a long time or we strain the supplies and that the less developed world, which has fewer resources, uh, let so many people squander, it, it, you know, this opportunity. And I'm just hoping that the world's development community uses this as a wake-up call to do more.